Howdy, everybody. Um, my name is John Cheney Lippold, as my great colleague Sis Smith just told you. I study algorithms, I study how identity is produced through data. And today I get to talk to you about what is titularly known as big data and the algorithmic citizen, but also the parenthetical I'm really interested in having us think through, which is how we remake the world through data. So we're going to think about how data as an object produces a world that we maybe don't really know about, we maybe don't really understand. So to start off, the mantra of today is data does not speak, it is spoken for. A lot of social scientists, a lot of positivists, we can call them, people who are really invested in producing data, nothing wrong with it, but they think that data says something by itself. Without voice, just it exists, emanates truth. But I want to suggest actually data is really at the hands of who interprets it, who speaks for it. And often the people who speak for it are not speaking for data, they're using data to speak for some sort of logic, some sort of power relation that they would vantage from, that they get, right? So, to think through this notion, I'm gonna get us to kind of go back about five months in May of this year, and a senior at Harvard University, his computer science dude, his name is Anan Khanna, and Anand Khanna is a very, very, very good programmer, and he's such a good programmer that he gets an internship at Facebook. So he's about to start his internship at Facebook, and he notices something based on his fandom, I guess, of Harry Potter. And if you know about Harry Potter, in the books slash movies, there's something called the Marauder's Map. The Marauder's Map is a magical map that if you have and you look at, you get to see where people go. You get to see person's names as they go around Hogwarts, wherever they are, where they're going. This allows Harry to, I guess, get into some hijinks, protect his friends, but also have some sort of like, advantage about how the world works and how Hogwarts works. So with this in mind, Kana actually said, well, I have data that's similar to this if I use Facebook Messenger. Then in Facebook Messenger, every time we leave a message on somebody's account, every time we chat with somebody, we're actually leaving a geolocation mark that says, this is where I am. So for example, if you say, I am here, historically, it would say, I am here, and then underneath would be a map that said exactly where here is. John is at the library. I'm five minutes away. John would be on a street outside the library. This data by itself doesn't seem that useful, but if we compile it, if we aggregate it, it can become extraordinarily useful, which is what Kana did. He took all of the data from all of the chats and all of his friends, aggregated them together, and then was able to produce what he called his own Marauder's Map on Facebook. This allowed him for about three days. He uploaded it to the Google Chrome store, and people downloaded it and it was able to kind of know where their friends were without them really realizing it until Facebook pulled it three days after. Hilariously enough, he also lost his internship at Facebook. So it was a lose-lose situation for him. But he came famous and now he's going to talk about the algorithmic citizen. Nonetheless, I want us to do a little bit of an exercise, which is to say that these minute pieces of data can become made, they can be made useful, they can become meaningful. So I want us to think about What kind of website surfing do we do during the normal you know, 24 hours that we're living today? So I want us to really this interaction. Give me a website, just yell it out, that you visit often that's not Google or Facebook. New York Times. New York Times, sorry. Actually, I'll do this. All right, what else? Artnews.com. Art Art All right, someone else? Amazon. Amazon, eBay, I heard. Bye-bye. <laughs> Tinder. All right, I like this. All right. We are going to go back to that in a second. If I can get my, excuse me. This was not supposed to happen, everybody. Sorry about this. There we go. So, in this example, we're going to see that all data can be spoken for, not just data that is explicit, the things we normally think about in terms of privacy, our names, our social security numbers, the things such as going to tinder.com 
or things such as sending a message that then geolocates your data can have extraordinarily meaningful meaning, uh, effects in our lives. So the way that we can begin to think about this, how data shapes what is possible in the world and how data makes who we are, is through what's on an envelope. This is metadata. Metadata is data about data, but historically it has been what is on an envelope, such as who sends the message, from where they send it, to whom they send it, and to where they send it. And importantly, on the top, we can see where it was sent, the actual post office, and of also the time and day it was sent. This data, seemingly piecemeal, seemingly not that useful on its own, can be made extraordinarily useful. This is an email with a comparable kind of similar set of data. This is what the recipient's email, the recipient's IP address, the sender's IP address, the sender's email, and the date and time. So you send an email to your friend, all this email, all this email uh, metadata is going to be public. It's going to be available if you have an ability to surveil the networks. This is a tweet. This is the metadata available in one tweet. You have the source, you have the name, you have where you are, you have it, when it was created, and you have the time zone, and even you have the language. So what language are you using when you write the tweet? Data about everything has metadata, and this metadata by itself is seen to be not that useful. It's seen to just be kind of the things on letters that you don't go to your friend's house just to see who sent him letters. You want to see what's inside of it. So who wants to see metadata? Who wants to understand what metadata does? So you probably don't care, but there's a lot of money to be made in metadata if you can understand what that metadata can be made to speak as. So marketers, obviously, are really interested in metadata. Quantcast is a San Francisco-based web analytics company. They are really into figuring out what your traffic says about you just by what websites you visit, what apps you visit, what categories you visit, what devices you use. And you can see on the bottom here, it says actual models include hundreds of factors. So it's not just these five things. It's a great surveillance assemblage of all of these companies collecting as much data as they can, which is just where you're going, when you went there, how often you go, et cetera. But they do is what they do is they create these patterns. They create the idea of what it means to be male, what it means to be college educated. A college grad is not somebody who has a sheepskin diploma. A college grad is somebody who visits sites X, Y, uses, and visits category K. So it's not about actual, the truth, the kind of modern notion with a capital T, this is what is a college graduate, or this is what is a male. I'm performing masculinity, I identify as a male. No, it's I act as if I was a male, or as if I was a college graduate. The way this works is if you go to like Yelp.com, for example, Quantcast is going to look at you and just take this piece of data that doesn't speak, it just is, and they're going to say, what does this really mean? So if you go to Yelp.com, you're going to suggest to Quantcast that you're likely to be a woman, you're likely to be 25 to 34, you're likely not to have kids, you're likely to make a little bit more money than the average American, you're likely to have gone to college or grad school, and you're most likely to be Asian. So the identity of race itself, or what they call ethnicity, is divorced from the actual lived experiences of white supremacy, is divorced from the experiences of what makes race an actionable category for politics, and makes it then just a category of identity of patterns of data. TheEconomist.com is male, 18 to 24, no kids, also Asian, a lot of grad school going on, and making a lot of money too. So if you go to these two websites, you could create this profile in your head of, we don't know their gender, but they're probably going to be younger, they're probably going to be Asian, they're probably not going to have kids, they're probably going to be well-educated, and they're probably going to make more money than the average American. Data can speak on behalf of us, but only if it's interpreted by somebody who makes it speak in a certain way. So mere website visits become the artifice of how we understand gender, how we understand race. Metadata can be made to mean something. So this is obviously a map of Chicago. It's called a heat map. It's a criminology heat map. And what it does is it takes data from different you know, intersections, different areas around Chicago, and it says, is this a high crime area? This is just data about crimes, where it was, when it was. You can do this over the hours, over the days. At 4 o'clock, the intersection outside here might be high crime, but then at 6 o'clock, it might be low crime. Then you could put police officers on the corner. You could put more lights. You could um, let people be aware, like, oh, this is a dangerous area during this time. The Chicago Police Department, though, in 2013, actually did something different. 
instead of just taking data about things, they started making these heat maps about people. They created something called the heat list, which was a bunch of data that was aggregated two generations deep. So me, my friends, and then the friends of my friends created a network of metadata that then would suggest who was and who was not criminal, or who was or who was not at risk. If you've heard about this, it's very compelling as an example of how data is speaks for you. But the idea of you don't have to actually do a criminal thing or actually be maybe potentially a victim of a crime for the Chicago Police Department to eventually knock on your door and tell them that we're going to be watching you. The idea of our data doesn't speak for us, but our data is interpreted for us by, in this case, the Chicago Police Department. Data is not just data. Data is interpreted. And the title of the talk is about big data, so let's think about what big data means and how do we interpret big data. This is a really useful definition. There's so many definitions of what data and big data can mean. Um, the best, most colloquial way we can think of what big data is is just it's not small data. It's the inverse of just a little thing. It's a thing that we can't really understand where it comes from, but we're going to just assume there's something in it, and we're going to find the patterns and have them rise up, bubble up to the top. But how can you understand what something is if you don't really know what you're looking at? This requires statistics. And a very, very, very compelling quotation from a, well, he's dead right now, but a British statistician named George E.P. Box, he says, essentially, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So big data becomes the, becomes the axiom of how we really understand how this plays out in real life, because Box isn't talking about gender. He's not talking about criminality. He's talking about how data itself can be made useful, knowing full well that it's wrong. Because you can imagine, if you've seen a graph, right? You know, you have a correlation, but there's always going to be outliers. You're never going to understand statistically the perfect way that reality can be translated into math, the perfect way that the qualitative realities of our life can be quantified in some particular way. The thing for me, though, is that there's also, I'm sorry, there's also another quotation in the same book, which is that, remember that all models are wrong, but the practical question is how wrong do they have to be to not be useful? So that becomes like, okay, we're going to accept that they're wrong, but we're going to understand that there's going to be a level, this kind of branch that breaks when it stops being useful because it's too wrong. The branch, in terms of our advertising on the internet, is informally an industry standard of 92% confidence. If you're 92% confident that I'm an Asian who's 18 to 34, I'm going to be treated as if I was an 18 to 34 Asian by marketers, by analytic firms, whatever. The idea, though, is statistics can never have 100% proof of anything. Confidence can never be 100%. Even the fact that this room might blow up just randomly never can be sure. It's always going to be something that might be outside the model because you can never predict the world perfectly. Or if we're like the Ward Lab at Duke University, we're going to take a bunch of data from news reports, not just a couple, but all of the news reports. We're going to mine the news reports and find different words. In Greece, for example, you might see the word crisis a bunch. This is on October 2014. You might see the word economic collapse. You might see the word um, revolution. Also, you're going to see economic matrices. You're going to see the GDP fall. You're going to see the population maybe shrink. When all of this data is aggregated together, Groups like the Ward Lab can produce metrics that then talk about the probability that Greece is going to go into an insurgency. In October 2014, it was 99%. Obviously, it didn't happen, but the idea is the data was speaking in a way that then let the Ward Lab interpret it in a certain way. So actually, the data didn't speak, but it was spoken for by the Ward Lab to say that Greece is at the onset of an insurgency. The idea, though, is that data produces truth when let read through the lens of who is manipulating it. And people who really, really like data don't just like data, they like a lot of it. So big data is this kind of fetishized object because it is supposedly everything. And this follows this ideology of dataism, which is that the data is the ability to give a true description of a reality. The data produces truth. And increasingly, more data produces more truth. And if you have all of the data, ostensibly have all of the truth, right? Um, Frederick Nietzsche, a while ago, he said something that's called, it's kind of the, the foremost phrase to understand how modernity and relationships to philosophy work. He said that God is dead, and God is dead is not that actually God 
is dead. It's just that the thing that once said what was true, good, or bad no longer exists. That what is true, good, or bad can be multiple. It can be relative. It can be counterposed. That I believe something and you believe something and it might be different. Datism is the idea that we can reproduce God's eye through the omnipresence, omniscient kind of eye of what God is by having everything by not just having a little piece of data about one sample size or one community, but literally having all of the data. And this is what's called collect it all. Collect it all is the mantra of big data. N equals all is big data. And that's what a lot of people really want. So there's this notion of completeness. There's this notion of recompiling the world in datafied form to then recreate the capital T. So God might be dead, but data is alive, and data will tell us the truth. Collect it all, though, also was the mantra of a certain former director of the NSA, Keith Alexander, who when in 2005 he came to the agency and he was kind of continuing an already existing process that was the NSA is going to start looking at everything and anything it could, but he really amped it up. And his collect it all was a suggestion that not only do we collect what we can get, but we're going to go into places that we probably shouldn't be and aggregate all of it because if we have enough data, we can understand the entire world. That historically, you could only understand, like if you have targeted surveillance, which is what the NSA really focused on for the past couple decades, you would look for a target. So John is in the library, he's in Chicago, he has, let's get this phone, this phone, he's connected to all these people, but we know who John is and we know where he is. This is the idea of the needle in the haystack, right? But collect it all also says, that if you look at the needle in the haystack, you're forgetting that there's an entire haystack where more needles could be. That if you have the entire haystack, you can understand that John is a needle, but then somebody else is a needle, and somebody else is a needle. And so the idea of the threats to the United States become kind of part of this collected all approach, that if you are only looking for one threat, you're avoiding the other threats. The NSA then became indebted to this notion. It became entirely impossible not to rely on big data as the solvent of how do, we, how do we resolve the problem of the United States' its imperial power trying to manage its interests across the world and using the technological apparatus of the internet to protect ourselves. So how does the NSA get all of it? How does the NSA actually collect it all? If you follow the Snowden revelations, you're going to see a couple things that seem familiar, but I really want to put it into two different groups. One of which is the NSA takes upstream data. Upstream data is the data that goes across the internet tubes that is just a search query. So for example, if you are in Chicago and you want to go to Japan, you go from Chicago to San Francisco, and then from San Francisco, you actually take a pipe or a cable underneath the ocean, and then you pop out in Japan. And then to get it back, you have to go back underneath the ocean and then pop out. So the NSA realized is actually there's this crazy material bottleneck of data. So Unlike a world where everything is kind of scattered and decentralized, you have about eight or ten different places from the western seaboard that if you were able to mine them, if you were able to connect to them, you'd have most of the data that goes to the United States. So this is what they did. They actually put on scuba gear, and they took a, a kind of a glass shard, injected it into the optical fiber, then let the existing traffic go to the router where it was destined, but then copy the data as it passed through into the NSA databases. Theoretically, if you have all of the data cables tapped, you would have a very large part of the data that happens in the world. But you don't have all of it, because while the temporal data of you know, tapping or the temporal data of I'm searching for something right now, it doesn't get to the email I sent last month. It doesn't get to the things that I might store within the servers of Google or Yahoo. So this is where PRISM becomes really important. And PRISM was the second thing that the NSA leaks um, were reported on. It's the more or less, it's a corporate espionage of the NSA. What they did is they used a man-in-the-middle attack to get into the databases of Microsoft, Google, Yahoo, et cetera. So your Google wasn't just, or you, the NSA wasn't just looking at the data as you make search queries. It was looking at your actual emails. It was looking at your video chats. Famously, the NSA would take screenshots every five seconds of Yahoo video chats. So they saw people in meetings. They saw people having cyber sex. They saw people talking to their families, and they would just save them. Because collect it all is not collect it all except for the embarrassing stuff. It's collect everything. So the NSA was very much indebted to this collect it all notion, so much so 
that they suggested, not only to use upstream data, but use prism data to create the notion of this omniscient God's eye view. Because with all of the data, you can produce truth. Or even you can produce the most useful model of truth. That might be wrong a little bit, but it still is efficacious. So a way to understand this is to go to Edward Snowden himself. This is an interview with Brian Williams from NBC. It's about two minutes. And the question that Brian Williams is asking is about a cell phone. Like, what can you understand by a single piece of data on my cell phone? Can anyone turn it on remotely if it's off? Can they turn on apps? Did anyone know or care that I Googled the final score of the Rangers-Canadiens game last night because I was traveling here? I would say uh, yes to all of those. Uh, they can absolutely turn them on with the, with the power turned off to the device. That's pretty scary, but the thing about the Rangers game is also scary. You might say, does anybody really care that I'm looking up the score for the Rangers game? Well, a government or a hacker or some other nefarious individual uh, would say yes. They're very interested in that because that tells a lot about you. First off, it tells you probably speak English. Uh, it says you're probably an American. Uh, you're interested in this sport. Uh, they might know uh, what your habits are. Where were you in the world when you checked this score? Do you check it when you travel or do you check it when you're just at home? Uh, they'd be able to tell something called your pattern of life. When are you doing these kind of activities? When do you wake up? When do you go to sleep? What other phones are around you when you wake up and go to sleep? Are you with someone who's not your wife? Are you doing something? Are you someplace you shouldn't be, according to the government, which is arbitrary, you know? Uh, are you engaged in any kind of activities that we disapprove of, even if they aren't technically illegal? And all of these things can raise your level of scrutiny, even if it seems entirely innocent to you, even if you have nothing to hide, even if you're doing nothing wrong. These activities can be misconstrued, misinterpreted, and used to harm you as an individual, even without the government having any intent to do you wrong. The problem is that the capabilities themselves are unregulated, uncontrolled, and dangerous. All because I googled Rangers Canadiens final score. Exactly. So I really like this because it really puts into perspective how a single piece of data can be made meaningful using the logics of the NSA or a hacker, or somebody who wants to manipulate your reputation. But it also suggests that we ask the question, like, this is really illegal, right? Like, this is entirely against the Constitution. The idea that a single score from a U.S. citizen, Brian Williams is a U.S. citizen, that his data, his search terms, his email, all of these things could be searched against the ostensible protection of the U.S. Constitution. So this is the kind of, I don't like red, so I used orange. This is kind of like halting. Like, we need to think, what does it mean then to think about privacy in an era where everything is collected, where everything could be made meaningful according to the logics of the NSA to quantcast whomever. So importantly, the idea is who has the right to privacy and what does privacy mean? And thus the consequent is who is a citizen online? Because when I have, I'm, I go to the airport, I show my ID and I'm like, this is me. I have access to the United States or my passport when I'm crossing a border. But on my phone, like, there's no way to understand if I'm a citizen or not. There's no real way to say this is what a citizen sounds like or looks like because in the United States, we don't have any metric like that. It's just about data. So to answer this question, we're gonna think about how citizenship works in the 21st century. So we're gonna do a second story. This time, it's June 2013, and on polar opposites of the world, two things are happening that are comparable in scope. One of which is in Rome, Italy, Cecil Kienge, is a Minister for Integration of Italy. Importantly, she is the first black cabinet minister of Italy. She's the most high-ranking politician who's black in Italy. She's extraordinarily prolific, extraordinarily important. And as Minister of Integration, she is endowed the charge of resolving the demographic tension of the country. So the past couple decades, we've seen a lot of immigration from the global south go to Italy. And this completely unsettles the notion of what it meant to be Italian. Because Italians used to be, you know, according to this idea of if my father or mother is Italian, I'm Italian. This is called juice sanguine. Juice rights, sanguine blood. So if the blood of my parents is passed into me, that blood is Italian, and thus I become Italian. Obviously, this has extraordinary racial components, has religious components. Italian didn't just mean Italian. Italian meant white. Italian meant Catholic. If we look back to Kenge, Kenge is actually a citizen. She immigrated from the Congo 
to Italy, learned perfect Italian, is like the model citizen, a married Italian person. She's the model citizen for any other form, but she faced extraordinarily racist abuse. People threw bananas, people used epithets. Congress people used epithets against her in the Congress. So in a response, Kenge was like, what if we went away from Jusangwini? And what if we instead shuffled and shuttled our citizenship allocation to Jus Soli? Jus Soli is the idea that Jus writes according to Soli land, where you're born. So one, Sangwini is your blood, essentially Italian because it's running through your veins, versus Soli, you were born there, and so you become Italian. If Italy moved to Jus Soli, you would then become Italian just by, by having by being born there, right? So the idea of, the idea of Italian, would completely change. Instead of being white and Roman Catholic, it could now be brown, black, Muslim, Hindu. It changes the demographic assessment. And Kienge, very famously, her position was abolished, kind of like Anna, that the hopefulness of maybe these interventions completely fell apart as more or less like, proto-fascists shut down her nomination, shut down her uh, pol political agenda. On the opposite side of the world, the exact same time that this was happening, Snowden lands in Hong Kong with four laptops in tow and you know, hauling information, thousands of documents that detailed everything that we kind of mentioned before, plus much, much more. The NSA was surveilling everybody. The NSA was collecting it all. The NSA really wasn't caring whose data it was collecting because all doesn't include, doesn't exclude Americans. All is everybody. So Snowden, like er erupted this debate, right? So everybody started talking about it. What is privacy? What does surveillance mean? Why does the NSA need all this information? And in response, the NSA kept on pumping this mantra out to us. That is, the NSA's activities are focused and specifically deployed against and only against legitimate foreign intelligence targets. Okay, so if you believe the NSA, then you're like, that's great. But what if you don't believe the NSA? Because they kept on using this terminology. Legitimate foreign target. Legitimate foreign target. And for me, it's like, Okay, legitimate, I mean, it has to be legitimate, that's just a redundancy. Foreign, that's assuming that, you know, it's also a redundancy, you're only supposed to be able to surveil foreigners, because the NSA cannot surveil US persons. And target, it gives us the idea, the idea that they're actually looking at specific people. They're looking at, I know John is this person, and I'm gonna kind of explain who he is, I'm gonna surveil him who he, about, about what his life is, according to the fact that I know who it is beforehand. So a legitimate foreign target, though, as we learned in the prison slides, is not a target at all. Nor is it foreign, nor is it really legit legitimate. It is a reasonable belief of 51% confidence that the specified target, or just user, is a foreign national on foreign soil. This is the idea of, since we can't prove our citizenship based on blood or birth, we have to prove our citizenship constantly, continually, through data, and this is what I call juice algorithmi, juice by algorithm, right? So algorithmic identification of our citizenship becomes extraordinarily weird. Because privacy, the thing that we, the Justice, well, Supreme Court Justice Brandeis in the early 20th century, he said privacy is the most comprehensive of all rights. And now privacy is completely indebted to a weird, kind of it's more, private, more foreign than citizen, or more citizen than foreign. The idea of Hannah Arendt's the right to have rights gets allocated by a, con like a temporary assessment of your data, because obviously your data changes. Obviously who you are in terms of how you move, who you talk to, the metadata you're producing, all of that is based on assumptions that we are constantly evolving creatures, that we're not just gonna be the same person over and over and over. So what data does the NSA use to allocate citizenship? Thanks to the Snowden documents we actually know, um, this is the 2009 Eric Holder signed FAA minimization procedures document that details how foreignness is determined by NSA officials. The actual, the following, and I don't like to do this, it's gonna sound like a Jeff Foxworthy routine. Like, you know, you might be a redneck if, you might be a foreigner if. Information indicates that a user of the electronic communications account address identifier has communicated directly with an individual reasonably believed to be associated with a foreign power or foreign territory. That means, and I'm completely serious, that you talk to somebody who is 51% confidence foreign. That you are likely to be a foreigner, a little bit more foreigner than citizen, if you talk to people who are foreign. Second one, you're more likely to be a foreigner if you're on the buddy list, contact list, Facebook friends with whatever, you have a connection with a 51% reasonable believed to be foreigner. More kind of crazy still, 
is if your IP address shows the range that is outside of normal American IP ranges and or you actually encrypt your communication, you are increasingly foreign. And most incredulously, in the 2008 document um, that was leaked to the Brazilian paper O Globo, they said that anybody who doesn't speak English is likely to be more foreign than citizen. So these pieces of data that can algorithmically per, like, build the identity of citizenship produce a citizenship that is not really real. It's entirely database and entirely seemingly constructed according to the fact that the NSA does want to surveil you, so it doesn't want to give you an out. At the same time, it was really interesting because I was living in Rome in June of 2013, and so I was speaking Italian to Italian friends on their contact list with an Italian IP, and I was also completely encrypting my communications. So on the logic of the fact that I'm a juice solely in juice on the citizen of the US, I was a juice algorithm foreigner for sure. So the notion we have, of the, th the reliance that we think we have, of the right to have rights, the idea of privacy, the idea of owning who we are in the face of the state, used to be a static thing, and now it's a dynamic modulatory phenomenon. So to get to this idea, a little, bit more f a little bit more deeply, we can look at this example. It's called Citizen X. A guy named James Bridle in the UK actually took this idea of juice algorithm and he made a piece of software that allocates your citizenship based on the websites you visited. So the fact that we did that exercise at the beginning suggests that we can use juice or the Citizen X to find out who we are. According to the data that we produced, we are 92% citizen of the United States, 4% citizen of Canada, and 1.5% of the UK and Ireland. This is an artistic rendition. It's not actually how they do it in the NSA, but it's based on where you are searching from and what the server is that you're going to. So some of those servers might be located in the UK or in Ireland, or maybe it bounces, the packet bounces through those countries. Nonetheless, the idea of this floating signifier of what is citizenship disallows us the constancy of either I'm citizen or I'm foreign. So in a way, we can think of the, the NSA's algorithmic citizenship is a useful model because it allows them to surveil everybody and allows them to kind of throw away the notions that we have of citizenship, but it's completely wrong. It's entirely fabricated. And so this notion for me of fabrication isn't that it's wrong and nobody's going to agree to it. It's, it's wrong and it's necessarily wrong because it's statistical. And that's a defense that the NSA has, that they don't have an ability to touch a body and prick them to get their blood or check their passport. They can only use the data available to them, and they created a citizenship nonetheless. The idea for me, then, is how does citizenship by algorithm, by data, produce a reality that's different than the reality that we're living right now? Or how does power address an algorithmic subject instead of a subject that's you know, physical? that has rights, that can, has a history. I look especially to the US drone program, um, especially in the Arabian Peninsula, but the idea of that drones are now becoming the predominant way that we interface militarily with a lot of the world. Um, this is proven by the fact, I think, um, in 2009, the Air Force had more drone pilots in training than actual pilots. So more people are training to be a person in a booth in Des Moines, Iowa, playing a simulation that has a drone in Yemen connected to it than an actual F-16 fighter flying over Yemen or flying over the Arab Gulf. Also though, because there's this virtuality of war, the distancing from who the soldier is to the actual person that is being killed, does this kind of NSA move that you don't have the ability to see who exactly you're looking at, who exactly is the target. You just have an idea about the target. And increasingly, you have a data-based idea about the target. It turns out that 90% of all drone strikes are done based on not the fact that I know that John is in this auditorium, but I know that John's cell phone is at this auditorium. And so the drone attack comes and it sees the cell phone and it locates the cell phone. I know within a couple meters where it is and so it launches a missile and then it kills ostensibly me. But the fact is that everybody, can, I can give my phone to somebody else. This is what people do. They actually, they know that the NSA was looking at their SIM cards, so they started putting their SIM cards in a bag, shaking the bag up, and then reassigning them by random locked. Kind of this interesting surveilling and surveilled relationship that is constantly evolving. But the fact is that we're removed from the idea of who is the index of political power. Who is the target? Is it a target of a person, or is it a target of data? 
And so now we can think about what it means to really have data be the subjective foundation for who we are in terms of citizenship, criminality, what it means to be gendered in an internet world, what it means to be raced. Where does white supremacist patriarchy work if I could be an Asian woman? Where does criminality work? Where does the idea of due process work if you're going to get a knock on your door just because your friends are criminals? Or what would happen if you eventually were killed according to the fact that your data suggested you were somebody else? For me, I'm extraordinarily invested in these questions, which is why I study them, but it allows us to see this Marauder Map example actually think much more thoroughly, because instead of just stalking the world, when data is spoken for, it's not just allowing us to be weirdos who just want to see where our friends are, it's actually rewriting what is true in the world. Because your friend could have their phone stolen and chat with people, and it's not that friend who is in this place in Cambridge, Massachusetts, it's the person who stole the phone. Comparably, if somebody changes and takes my cell phone, they become me. They produce data that's about me. The idea of the world is no longer an idea of the world that is. It's now represented as data, and the consequence of that representation is extraordinarily new, extraordinarily nascent, and extraordinarily dangerous. So thank you. So I think we have questions, right? One down here on your right. It's the one question that isn't asked is, is that, that data is only good as the one that asks the right question or doesn't ask the right question, or yeah. otherwise data is useless. Are you saying that I'm saying data is useless? No, I'm no. just saying that data is only useful if someone asks or doesn't ask the right question. Yeah, so, is the, so that's the idea. Is the NSA right asking any questions? No, they're just taking everything that exists. They're collecting it all. So for me, I'm really interested in what it means to collect versus doing like survey questions or do work that statisticians do, which I think is you have to find how to narrow what that data could potentially mean. But the ultimate move of remaking the world in terms of data doesn't care about the actual context of that data. But the fact that my phone is here could have a bunch of reasons from the fact that I have to give a talk to the fact that I like being in this room. Those are entirely decontextualized when we just know that this phone is in this room, period. Sir, there's a lot of real smart people looking at data. Are there any smart people sending out a lot of false data to try to screw this all up? That's a very interesting question. It is, it, so this is the idea when data becomes made, a meaning becomes made on data's terms, the only way you can really understand resistance is on data's terms, because you can't just be like, I'm not telling anybody where, yet, where I am because my phone is telling them, even if I don't want them to. Um, there's a lot of, there's one program that I really like called Track Me Not. Track Me Not's a web browser plugin that is in the background of your browser, and it searches the six or seven top news sites and just takes phrases from their front pages and then randomly searches all of the big four search engines with those phrases. So every six seconds, it searched for one was jaundiced newborns. So whatever that means, who knows? But now, instead of saying, this is what John Cheney Lipple is doing, it is, this is what John Cheney Lipple is doing, plus an algorithmic pattern randomizing machine that makes all of the ideas of who I am completely indecipherable because it's overloaded with meaning. We've got a question over here on the right. Okay. Um, does China's policy preventing citizens from Facebook and other social media sites prevent NSA from tracking their citizens as much? So in a way, that's, I think it's really kind of instructive because I don't know if we all know, Mark Zuckerberg learned Mandarin. He is very much invested in bringing Facebook to China, but China has its own <laughs> Facebook. So it does totally put a kind of mm in the machinery of the NSA because they don't have access to that data, but they do have the ability to hack into those servers, much like they did to Facebook. It would just be a different institution. So the rules that they used to hack into Facebook would have to be repurposed to fa hack into the Chinese Facebook. Um, so in a way, it's just another hurdle for the NSA if they wanted to get that data. And since it's a foreign company, they actually can do, what, or foreign company, they can do whatever they want to it. So they can do attacks on those servers. They can hack it without any legal worries, um, this is what we call cyber warfare, yeah. Okay, one more question. Uh, what happens when they link facial recognition technology with cameras with all of this data or 
they're now coming out with the iris or your eye, and so they actually have a real person that's linked with all this data that's being collected. So this is the kind of quintessential idea of like, what is a way that instead of having just data about cell phone IPs or MAC addresses, it's what if the body can be mapped and made data. Um, it's extraordinarily powerful as a metric, but it's never perfect. And I'm not gonna say that that's gonna you know, disallow the government from using it. Um, Facebook has invested billion, not, not billions, millions of dollars in facial recognition technology. The NSA has invested billions. So what happens when they have drones in stadiums that go around and take pictures of everybody? And I've actually, in soccer stadiums, they've actually found like criminals who are on the, the most wanted list and have apprehended them in the stadium because their face popped up. But what happens when everything is? And that's honestly a question I'm not prepared to answer because it's a question that's actually much more profound than just data because it's an actual kind of an invasion of bodies. It's an invasion of our soul identity of people who can author who we are and instead who we are is being told by the NSA. Related to that, if this is where we are now, where are we going to be in 2025? I'm really bad at predicting, so. I will say that increasingly the idea of dataism suggests that more and more data is going to be c collected, but we can also parallel that with the, um, I'm not going to call it a fetish, but like the desire we have to datafy everything. And I'm not critical of this. I just, this is a truth that the Internet of Things connects our data of not just our bodies, but our toasters. So now our caloric intake of how much toast we're eating has the ability to be connect to our profiles. When we have a Fitbit, how many steps we're taking, um, how fast we're running, how many calories are we taking. All of these things, when we datafy them, become then fodder for machines that try to collect it all and make pattern assessments. Um, so in the next 25 years, I think we're going to see a very interesting invocation of these two uh, phenomena that could be bad, could be not good, could be good. I don't know. It's entirely up to the air of who has the power to interpret the data. Um, would you comment on, if you're familiar with it, David Egger's book, The Circle, which is a uh, fictional projection the Dave Egger's of the book? future. Yeah. yeah. I, like, I like Circle. Um, Circle is a world of like a, a new Google, and the, there's a kind of a moral imperative to be transparent, which is that if we're hiding, Eric Schmidt of Google he famously said that privacy, nobody should have privacy because if you're doing something bad, you shouldn't be doing it anyway. So why do you need privacy? Which completely discounts the centuries of privacy theory and law that say that, you know, m the most beautiful way to think about privacy, it's a breathing space to be. We close doors because we need a place to be who we are. We need to know, understand who we are. Um, in the circle, there's this kind of drive outwards. It's the, idea, the idea of it's moral to not have privacy because with privacy is corruption. With privacy is danger. With privacy is violence. So if everything was transparent, everything was communicated, everything was public, we would ostensibly lead better lives. Um, I think the NSA parallel is a little bit divergent because we don't know we're being surveilled by the NSA. Um, I think that both are dystopian in a way, but I think the NSA is much more s like s smooth. The dystopian isn't as affronting as the circle, but it's still there, I think. How do we develop protocols uh, that enable us to separate the socially useful yeah. kinds of applications from those that might be bordering on the, gosh, that's not so good and it's really invading our privacy kind of applications? Yeah, I think that's the question that some genius potential billionaire is going to make. How do you create a regulatory aspect of our data that for use? You know, Google Flu, which actually just shut down recently, um, used to take the keyword structures of every keyword you would do on Google and it correlated it according to the flu trends of actual CDC data, Center for Disease Control. And so they could figure out if you were searching for certain terms, there would likely be a flu epidemic six weeks later. And so this data actually produced the idea of flu six weeks before the CDC recognized it. So if you have all this space with this disease, you could, you know, stop it. You could put a bunch of NyQuil, like in the city, I don't know. Um, <laughs> The idea, though, they're socially useful things, but importantly, and this is the kind of the argument of the talk, is that it depends on who has the data, because um, VIX having the data is different than the CDC having the data. You know, VIX wants to have people, it's not being anti-VIX, but VIX wants people to be sick to get better than then be sick again, because if everybody's better all the time, they're not going to be selling any product. So the notion of the logic, is that capitalist or state logic, or is it public health logic, is pretty much the determining quality. And if you can make an app, or you can make a piece of software that disallows m m malicious use, Extraordinarily useful, but I don't see it happening quickly. Right in the center. It 
seems that uh, this operation or, or the operation of people who are, are gathering the data um, rests to a great degree on an acceptance of the notion of pro or comfort with probability of something being yeah. within a range. Yeah. In the industry I work in, they can't stand that. They just, you know, and, the, and they would benefit enormously by if they would accept it. When did this start to happen in, in I don't know, in data, in, in statistical theory or in, uh, I don't know, uh, insurance, whatever, the idea that this is, there's a probability this will happen. We will act on that probability as opposed to trying to know something for certain. That's, I like that. So in 2012, Facebook bought a patent from Friendster, if you remember that. Um, Friendster had a patent that Facebook bought, which was that your credit score, we're talking about actuarial stuff, your credit score is determined often by your income, your ability to pay credit, your history with credit. But Facebook said, what if we could connect everything to it? What if you could connect your social data to it? So all your friends' credit scores could then have an effect on your credit score. This is only available, so you could give a lower credit score if your friends are really bad at credit because they might I don't know, propel you to not pay your credit cards. But if you have a lot of good credit friends, they would be like, no, you have to pay your credit card, John. Um, <laughs> who knows? That's, the idea is there's no reason to it. It's just a pattern. Lower credit score social networks produce lower credit score or produce more risk for the insurance company. This can be thought back to the 1970s, though, because when things became datafied, when you actually started having data that, wasn't, that was in the computer database especially, you started to think, oh, people have a lot of money to make. If they could deny somebody a credit card who wouldn't pay it, that's extraordinarily useful. So they started in the 70s and increasingly in the 80s, then eventually in the 90s, and that's why we have a lot of the ideas of, of digital redlining, which is saying that we have data that suggests that these people in this zip code are not good credit people, so we're not going to give them that. And obviously, you know, those, the reasons why they're not paying their credit cards is not just because they're bad credit people, it's often there's economic issues, there's racial divides, there's lack of education, there's lack of intelligence about what a credit card is. So all of these kind of structures became wiped away when it was just this zip code is bad at paying credit card payments. Right over here on your right. Thank you for the really interesting talk. Oh, thank um, you. I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about the, what the algorithms are, like how do they work, and um, if we knew more about them, would that give us more of an ability to um, respond in a way that preserves our privacy? Yeah. Um, Who makes them, et cetera? No, totally. So a lot of the problems I have with doing this kind of research is that you're only available what is given to you. So in the sense of the PRISM slide that actually talked about 51% confidence is not, I don't even know the data, I don't know the actual slide that has that, because it's Laura Portress, who's the um, journalist of that article, she talking about it. So I don't actually see the, the data. I think, though, that um, as I do more and more research, the actual algorithm is not really necessarily an algorithm that is automatic. It's an algorithm, algorithmic logic. So there probably is a computer program that says this is somebody who is suspicious or somebody deserving of citizenship or foreignness. Um, but it's actually at the whim of the NSA analysts, because famously the NSA analysts, if they would go against, and actually go against the logic and go against the algorithm and surveil somebody who was a U.S. person, um, they would have to do like a, a form that said, I did this, my bad, and the NSA documentation said, actually, it's no big deal if it happens. So there was a structure within the place that said that even if the algorithmic logic failed, and you still, because it's wrong, and you actually surveilled somebody who was a U.S. person, it doesn't matter because there's no consequence. Um, in terms of resisting it or kind of muddling with it, I actually don't know, because the, the structure of the internet is never national. A query from Canada, or a query from Chicago to Ann Arbor, Michigan, where I live, often goes through Toronto, because it's light speed, it doesn't have to obey borders, and so it just obeys the quickest, emptiest pipe. And so often that cross crosses a, a national boundary and thus makes the traffic foreign. So the way the internet set up kind of lets this algorithmic citizenship function in a way that everybody's a foreigner, which is the logic of what the NSA wants. Um, in terms of resistance, I think that encryption is the best way. Also, there's, you know, we can use Tor. If you know, Tor is a way to kind of like proxy your searches and your queries and your just web traffic. So it's not you asking, it's you asking a friend to ask for another friend to ask another friend to then eventually ask and then going back. So it takes a long time, but it does disassociate your patterns from a single individual to a much more kind of mishmash uh, agglomeration, I guess we would say. Your final question's in the back. Yes, uh, thank you for this talk. I think the awareness on this topic is uh, very important. So um, I, my question is more of a curiosity. You've referenced some um, browser tour and, and so on. 
How has studying this topic intensively altered your own interactions uh. with online activity and also exchanges be with others? How has it altered your interactions? So when this came out, I kind of, since I've been studying this for a while, I kind of knew it was happening, so I was never, in a way, I kind of, I knew I was screwed. Not because I'm screwed, but I think we're all screwed, in a way, <laughs> which is horrible, but it's also, it kind of, it leaves the burden off of your shoulder that you're going to do something wrong, because you've already done everything wrong. We're always doing things that are wrong, that people often don't see it. Um, I do remember when I was, to go back to when I was in Rome, I got an email from a friend of my brother's, and he was a tour developer, and he had just read the documents, and NSA, famously, they surveil people three degrees away. So the CPD surveils people two degrees away from you. So you, your friends, and their friends. That becomes their social network. The NSA does three degrees deep. So if you have somebody who is a high-value target, their friends, who are their friends, who are their friends, become involved in the surveillance web of potential vulnerability. Uh, and this guy is a tour developer, so the NSA totally is surveilling him. And then at the end of his email, he put a new signature which was welcome to the watch list, winky face, which for me was like very nice to know. He's knowing about this, he's alerting you that now you're part of this, this relationship. But, and this is not to make you all angry, but because you're in the same room as me, there is a productive interrelationality that now my cell phone is connected to y'all's and I'm connected to him. So it's this productive sense that we're all in it together, but in a kind of bad way. Yeah. So anyway, thank you, thank you so much.